Professor Gordon is well known for having been the first uh, international legal expert to have drafted an indictment on incitement to genocide. We've been speaking about the Genocide Convention here and there and uh, the fact that it has a clause which makes incitement to genocide a crime. Uh, here's the first person who actually turned it into a legal uh, document that was used in the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, used against uh, the Hutu uh, supremacists who were in control of certain aspects of the Rwandan media, and he will explain it uh, more fully than I will. Uh, but having his contribution here is very important because people sometimes say, well, you know, people say all kinds of things. Or, well, when the Iranians talk about wiping Israel off the map and, and even worse statements, now that's not really a war crime. It's not really something that you can move against. Well, in his law articles, Professor Gordon has even said that the, case, the Iranian case is more explicit and more clear-cut than the Rwandan case. And yet, while there was an international tribunal for Rwanda, there have not been such equivalent measures taken against Iran. So uh, I think we're very lucky to have uh, Professor Gordon with us, and I'll turn the floor over to him. Thank you. It's very powerful indeed to be in this building and to realize that uh, in the 1990s, uh, in 1994 in particular, um, such terrible things were going on, and they could not have happened without speech, without hate speech. And uh, I appreciate as an American, and we're here in the United States, the value of the First Amendment and the importance of freedom of speech. But we have to realize that speech and atrocity go hand in hand. You cannot have atrocity without hate speech. Uh, people are not going to be willing to kill their neighbors unless those neighbors have been dehumanized and they are no longer treated as human beings. And that is why uh, we absolutely have to keep the Rwanda case in mind because in modern times uh, it's the most horrific and powerful example of such dehumanization uh, and it led to such terrible consequences, which I'll talk about. Um, I, I will give you some background to the Rwanda genocide and the role that incitement played, um, but I also want to talk to you about some of the legal cases. Uh, Ambassador Baker referenced the Akiyezu case. I'll talk about that and, and some of the other very important ones. Uh, and from that, um, we have a body of law um, that uh, it has come together and that has allowed me to uh, give my analysis regarding the case of Iran, which I'll, I'll reference uh, when I talk about the perspectives on future of incitement law. So that's kind of the roadmap of where I'm going to be going. Uh, in talking about the Rwanda genocide itself, I want to give you a, bit, a little bit of background um, and talk about some of the incitement that was taking place before the genocide and then uh, what happened actually during the genocide itself and the role of the media and then um, incitement uh, and, and the way that the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and other courts have seen uh, the impact that it had on the mass violence. Many of you may be acquainted generally with the history of the genocide, but let me just specify that uh, Hutus uh, took power in 1959, uh, Rwanda was a Belgian colony, uh, and then ultimately Rwanda gained independence in 1962. And during these early years of the country uh, and its independence, uh, there were large-scale episodes of violence perpetrated by the majority Hutus against the minority Tutsis. Um, I could go into greater depth about the history and, and the resentments that were built up as a result of colonial rule. But suffice to say that as a result of these slaughters, uh, many Tutsi fled, uh, and uh, this refugee community uh, coalesced uh, in Uganda, uh, among other places. But it was in Uganda where uh, certain Rwandan refugee communities had been fighting in the bush with the Awari Museveni, 
uh, in his bid to take control in Uganda that a rebel group formed called the Rwandan Patriotic Front. And they decided that they wanted to bring Tutsis back to Rwanda. And they had uh, an invasion of the country in October of 1990. Um, this led to a number of different things happening in Rwanda. Uh, it had been a one-party state. It became a multi-party state. The economy in Rwanda got very shaky. And the president, Juvenile Haber Yamana, realized that he had to uh, allow more political participation, uh, that he had to open media up. And this sort of led, ultimately, to the formation of some of the extremist media that I'm going to talk about. But it also led to something known as the Arusha Peace Accords. Uh, which were designed to allow the, the Tutsis to come back into the country and participate in government. Uh, they were signed in, in August 1993. Um, they contemplated a transitional government with Tutsi participation in that government and incorporation of Tutsi rebel troops into the Rwandan army. And then to implement them, the Security Council uh, in this building created what was known as UNIMIR. Uh, which was a peacekeeping mission to monitor the transition to unification and peace. Uh, you all may have heard of Romeo Dallaire, who was the head of UNIMIR, uh, who witnessed some horrible things during the genocide and who saw what was coming, asked for help, and didn't get it. Um, in any event, President Harbi Arimana was in a difficult position. Nominally, he would tell the international community that he wanted to implement the Accords because he needed their support. But within the extremist Hutu community in his own country, he was trying to let them know that he didn't really support the accord. So he was doing this difficult dance. And the extremist Hutus felt that he was selling them out and that if, in fact, the Arusha Accords were implemented, that there would be horrible consequences for the Tutsis. And this leads up to uh, the cataclysm that will follow. That cataclysm was brought on certainly in large part by this new media, which had come about with the loosening of control the government had over the media, the monopoly that it had. And a large number of newspapers uh, started to circulate. One in particular, Kangura, which became quite notorious. Uh, and then a radio station, RTLM, uh, and the government radio station, Radio Rwanda, started to team up together and they were disseminating hate speech regarding Tutsis. Uh, the radio stations began to broadcast hate messages. And the newspapers would refer to Tutsis as Ambassador Prosser mentioned, in Yenzi, or cockroaches. That was the Kenya Rwanda word. Uh, and then you had the formation of militia, the youth wing of the MRND, which was Habri Arimana's party. Uh, known as the Inner Ahamwe, those who stand together, those who work together, uh, were formed from the ranks of disaffected youths. They were given machetes and various primitive weapons that were being purchased and stockpiled. And as uh, Colonel Bagasora, who really led the genocide, said, they were preparing for the apocalypse. And as this was happening, Tutsi were being beaten and murdered. And as I said, Romeo Dallaire, the Unimir chief, received an anonymous message that massacres were being planned against them. There were lists of names. Uh, this was a cold-blooded, calculated plan to destroy an ethnic group in this country. Unfortunately, the reports that came to this building uh, were ignored, uh, as were his requests to seize arm caches. And there were to be dire consequences. Um, but let me just say, because we're, we're focusing here on the role of incitement, that during this time period, there were some dress rehearsals for the genocide. I think it's really important to note that authorities had a sense that they were going to have to use incitement to make their plans succeed. And so a couple of instances that I want to highlight. One was in Bugacera, uh, a region not far, or, or a city not far from the capital of Kigali. Uh, where the radio, Radio Rwanda, was used to inflame locals against the Tutsi. And then the government brought in militia. And they orchestrated the massacre of Tutsis in Bugacera. 
and they saw that it was quite effective. The radio got people fired up, inflamed. The militia came in and told them, hey, we can do something about this, and slaughter ensued. The second example is the speech, the infamous speech of Lan Mugacera uh, at the end of 1992. Uh, he, being a prominent member of Javier Hermano's MRND, gave a speech calling for the extermination of Tutsis via metaphors. Uh, for example, and, and most infamously, exhorting the audience to send Tutsis back to Ethiopia via the, via the Nyabarongo River. And this metaphor is, is chilling because many Tutsi bodies were thrown in this river after mass violence, violence in 1959. The audience understood what this, this horrible speech meant. Uh, he was indicted uh, by the Rwandans, fled to Canada. Uh, he was deported back to Rwanda last year, and he is now standing trial. Um, and I am trying to consult on that, and hopefully uh, things will be done properly. Uh, but he needs to face justice. That brings us to RTLM. Radio Televisión Libre de Mil Colines, the infamous station known as Radio Machete uh, by many. And I just wanted to, to emphasize that there were four types of message uh, that were disseminated before the genocide. Okay, so this is even before the slaughter begins, where this radio station is trying to condition people to, uh, to, to kill their neighbors. Uh, first of all, there were general efforts to create animosity toward Tutsis criticizing Tutsis for having too much wealth uh, or engaging in ethnic stereotyping in reference to their physical characteristics. Uh, the, the cliche that they were tall and thin and had long noses and, and things like that. Um, broad, broadcasts that dehumanized Tutsis by equating them with cockroaches or nyenzi uh, or inkotani, violent warriors or killers from feudal times. Uh, and to say that all Tutsis are like this uh, because certainly people could have said, well, uh, the RPF was, was an enemy force that was trying to come in, and the Tutsis in Rwanda were a fifth column, and that's just nonsense. Uh, these were generalized attacks that said all Tutsis are like this. They're all trying to kill uh, Hutu, and uh, they're violent warriors, killers from the past, or they're cockroaches. Um, Third, there were acknowledgments of RTLM's reputation as anti-Tutsi and inciting hatred toward Tutsis, telling listeners that RTLM sets people at odds with others and glorifying that, saying it's good that we're separating Hutu from Tutsi. Uh, we're creating tension, we're heating up heads, we're preparing you. And then, most troubling, specific verbal attacks against particular Tutsis, uh, which of course in the genocide uh, during April 6th through the end of July uh, were ramped up significantly. But I, I give you one example. April 3rd, 1994, there was a broadcast where a doctor in Shangugu, a uh, province in Rwanda, was denounced. Three days later, he was burnt alive in front of his house. Uh, these sorts of things ha happened, uh, of course, in tremendous numbers during the genocide, but there were certainly previews and the international community had a sense of what was happening. And it's absolutely inexcusable that nothing was done. And when we hear these chilling words coming from Tehran, uh, we also have to wonder uh, how they can just be said with complete impunity. It leads to genocide. And on April 6, 1994, the airplane of the Rwandan president, Javier Imana, returning from implementation negotiations in Arusha, was shot down over Kigali. And almost immediately, roadblocks were set up all over Kigali, death squads began killing prominent Tutsis and moderate Hutu politicians. Uh, infamously, a group of Belgian blue helmets were murdered with the goal of facilitating the withdrawal of Belgian troops and Unimir. And soon, the killing spread across the country. RTLM uh, began intensifying its message, targeting people. Um, and uh, by the middle of July, approximately 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutu had been slaughtered. Uh, primarily with machetes. Hard to imagine. But it only could have happened through the incitement. The incitement which became, as I say, more intense during the genocide. In addition to the sorts of things that were being said before the genocide, there were new sorts of messages that were coming out over the airwaves. 
calls for a blanket extermination of all Tutsis, uh, including dehumanization of Tutsis in different ways, calling them snakes, other animals, uh, use of code words such as go to work, which was understood to mean kill Tutsis, reporting that extermination had taken place and praising it, uh, calls for attacks on Unimir, and downplaying the extermination or urging the population to hide traces of it to improve Rwanda's image among the international community. There are such compelling bits of evidence here of people who knew exactly what they were doing, who knew that what they were doing were criminal, was criminal, and they were trying to hide it. Um, I give a couple of, of quick examples. In June 1994, Kantano Habimana, one of the uh, well-known announcers on RTLM, said, 1,000 young men must be recruited rapidly. They should all stand up so that we will kill the Inkotani and exterminate them. The reason we will exterminate them is that they belong to one ethnic group. Look at the person's height and his physical appearance. Just look at his small nose and then break it. Uh, pretty chilling language. George Ruju, uh, the only European or non-Rwandan white person who was indicted and convicted by the, the tribunal, called upon the population, particularly the military and the inner Ahamwe, to finish off the 1959 revolution, uh, which everyone understood as an incitement to massacre the entire Tutsi population. And in light of all this, uh, when the uh, case of the executives that Ambassador Gold talked about that I worked on uh, finally came to its conclusion, uh, the ICTR pronounced, and I quote, the chamber accepts that this moment in time, the, the downing of the airplane, served as a trigger for the events that followed. That is evident. But if the downing of the plane was a trigger, then RTLM and Kangura were the bullets in the gun. The trigger had such a deadly impact because the gun was loaded. The chamber therefore considers the killing of Tutsi civilians can be said to have resulted, at least in part, from the message of ethnic targeting for death that was clearly and effectively disseminated through RTLM and Kangura before and after April 6, 1994 a very concise and powerful statement on the role of incitement in the genocide. Now, I mentioned I would talk briefly about the legal uh, part of this. Let me just say, by way of background, that the provisions in the International Criminal Tribunal statute that I worked with came from the Genocide Convention in 1948. Article 2 of the convention defines genocide as a series of acts, including, for example, killing and causing serious bodily or mental harm, committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group as such. Article 3 then states that a number of related acts committed in furtherance of Article 2 shall also be punishable. This includes, at Article 3b, direct and public incitement to commit genocide. This is the root of this crime, right here. And it was transposed directly into Article 23C of the ICTR statute, and several defendants have been prosecuted and convicted pursuant to this section of the ICTR statute. So the ICTR cases have fleshed out the elements of incitement to genocide. Those cases include, as we heard earlier, uh, the Akiyezu case, which was the first judgment from the tribunal which dealt with uh, incitement. Um, it also included the case of the prime minister of the Rump government during the genocide, Jean Kambanda. Uh, he called for murder in speeches and on the radio using metaphors, as did Ruju that I mentioned earlier. Uh, his case came to judgment in 2000. Uh, he pled guilty. And then uh, the media case that I read the portion of the judgment from in 2003. Those cases give us the basic elements uh, of this law. And when we look at it, we need to ask, where was the utterance issued? Is it sufficiently public, right? Because it's direct and public incitement to commit genocide. How was it interpreted by the audience? Is it sufficiently direct? What was the state of mind of the person uttering the words? Is there sufficient intent? What is the content of the statement? Is it permissible free speech? Or is it, is it criminal incitement? And then must there be resulting violence? Is causation? a requirement. In other words, does there have to be violence that follows the incitement in order to uh, gain a conviction? And a little bit of more information in terms of direct. What does that mean? Well, in light of the, the language's cultural and linguistic content 
whether the persons for whom the message was intended immediately grasped the implications thereof. And public is pretty straightforward. Call for criminal action in a public place or by mass media. Intent, the same as intent to commit genocide. Content is the key. We look at purpose. Is it legitimate news, historical research, text? We look at the words themselves. Context, both internal and external. What's going on around and what is the, the speaker doing? The relationship between the speaker and the subject. Are we talking about a government like in the case of Rwanda and a majority speaker versus a dissenting or minority speaker where we're going to have more speech protection and then causation. And the cases have determined that causation is not necessary. The words themselves give rise to criminal liability in the proper context. Uh, and there is kind of a twilight zone. These legitimate objectives I talked about, historical research, dissemination of news and information, public accountability of government authorities, and then illegitimate objectives such as explicit calls for violence like the ones that we heard and the examples I gave. Uh, there is a twilight zone of hate speech not explicitly calling for violence, and that's where we have to do the hard work and determine uh, whether we have legitimate expression or criminal incitement. In terms of the contemporary application of this, I want to point out that there was terrible violence in Kenya after the 2000 presidential election. Uh, and a radio announcer, Joshua Arup Sang, uh, has been indicted by the International Criminal Court in connection with his radio broadcasts, uh, and he is scheduled to go to trial in April. So we need to pay attention to that because it relates to this, and we have to see how the law is going to develop. But let me just say that Kenya is about to have elections again next week, and the Kenyan airwaves are being saturated again by hate speech. So. Are we really learning the lesson? Um, I'm, I'm concerned that, that maybe we're not. And that's why this meeting is so important and that hopefully we'll all go out and work toward uh, making sure that these kinds of hate messages are not normal on part of public discourse um, because uh, it's happening. It's still happening as we, as we speak here today. And of course, the example that we've been focusing on Iran. Uh, we, we heard examples of the Iranians uh, engaging in calls for the destruction of Israel. Uh, some of this language is even more explicit, as you can see, as I mentioned, than what we saw in Rwanda. Uh, dehumanization of Israelis, uh, referring to them as cancers that have to be removed. Uh, just denying the Holocaust, which is part and parcel of, of what they do. Um, and within the context of Iran developing nuclear weapons and its support for terrorist groups bent on Israel's destruction, a credible argument can be made that certain Iranian leaders are liable for incitement to commit genocide. And yet, as Ambassador Gold has noted, uh, we don't see anything uh, being done to try to uh, uh, bring these leaders to justice. And so that's another situation that needs to be remedied. So we have a lot of work to do, but we have made some progress, and there is a foundation, there is a basis for us to go forward. And uh, I appreciate your attention here today, and um, I look forward uh, to hopefully working with you and, and others uh, as we, uh, we try to eradicate this horrible scourge of hate speech, incitement, uh, and mass violence. Thank you.